My name is Mandy Altimus Stahl, and I am the archivist here at the Maslin Museum. And today I'm going to be talking about Maslin and the Underground Railroad. Slavery in America really began shortly after European settlers arrived here on the shores. The very first slaves having arrived in 1619. They were at first kind of treated like indentured servants who had things that they needed to do, uh, but as the, the treatment worsened um, and it really became a, a slave labor force, many of those slaves wanted to escape. Um, so, you know, from the very beginning, uh, the, the look to escape those situations uh, was very crucial. Uh, the British Empire ended slavery in 1833, so many years before uh, the United States would. Um, so kind of looking to Canada as this, this safe, free country where slaves could escape from the United States uh, up north. So the goal was typically to go from the south uh, and, and get to that freedom uh, in the north. So Ohio really formed a great place for fugitive slaves to, to find refuge. Uh, there were a lot of Quakers who settled here and Quakers did not believe in human bondage. Uh, so many of the uh, people who were on this network of freedom were Quakers. Uh, Isaac Russell wrote from somewhere in the South to Thomas Roach, uh, who was here in Massillon in 1816. And he said, I can have little satisfaction in remaining long in this state when abominable slavery is tolerated with all its evils, which I witness with disgust and dismay. And so Thomas Roach, uh, who founded Kendall here in 1812, um, really worked with a variety of committees uh, through the Quaker church and through the community um, to, to make a plan for fugitive slaves and uh, slaves who were freed, uh, who were looking to start a new life, uh, you know, build a home, build a family. So in the 1840s, the, the Quaker church really took up the mantle of, of ending slavery. And so after the, the Quaker church's yearly meeting in Salem, Ohio, uh, in 1849, there was an anti-slavery bugle newspaper, uh, which is full of fantastic facts. Uh, it was printed out of Lisbon, Ohio. And these little articles start to appear uh, where Macedonians are really taking up, uh, you know, the, the anti-slavery movement. We see some important Macedonians, including Betsy Mix Cowles, Marianne Russell, and Harriet Steese, who are uh, on the front lines uh, fighting the good fight. So these freedom networks also uh, extended into Indiana, and uh, Levi Coffin, uh, who was a, a Quaker leader, had uh, coined the term Underground Railroad in 1831. And that was really where that came up. You can see this picture of uh, Levi Coffin and his home. And then you can also see he actually, in defying the law, uh, wanted to actually show some of the people that he helped to freedom. So he had this picture taken with those who were staying with him at the time in the 1840s and 50s. In 1793, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act guaranteed that slaveholders could recover their escaped slaves if they were pursued. But if runaway slaves reached a free state, such as Ohio, uh, they were likely to be kind of left alone. Um, there wasn't really uh, any law that required them to re be returned to slavery until the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And this is where we see uh, a lot of slave catchers who come up into Ohio to actually retrieve those who uh, have escaped slavery. Um, and so a lot of stories uh, out of Massillon and Ohio uh, you know, there were a lot of, of people who had escaped and were, were living their lives here with their homes and suddenly they're in fear for their lives and they have to move north to Canada in order to really seal in that, the freedom that they've obtained. So this newspaper article is, uh, it's great. There's a, a wonderful project going on through Cornell University called Freedom on the Move. And uh, because the records for uh, for slaves, for freed slaves, for fugitive slaves are so sparse, not full of detail. These, these runaway slave ads are very important in getting descriptions of people, you know, names uh, and places where they were from. Um, and especially if you're trying to do genealogy and trace your history back to this era, these kinds of things can be incredibly helpful for tracking those down. So uh, in 1850, uh, with the, the Fugitive Slave Act going into effect, a lot of people were opposed to it. Um, and uh, published in the Canton Repository in October of 1850. Uh, there were many, many citizens of Canton and Massillon and everywhere in between who were, were saying that they were opposed to uh, the Slave Act. 
Uh, and you can see here some of the names that are listed. You might recognize Arvine Wales, uh, as in Wales Road, um, very, very prominent citizen, landowner, and uh, man who served on many, many uh, different boards and committees to help our community. In addition to people finally saying out loud, um, you know, <laughs> with the full understanding there might be repercussions, the group uh, of the Anti-Slavery Bugle starts to see a lot of conventions formed. So there were conventions in Maslin and Twinsburg in the 1840s, and major players uh, in the anti-slavery movement, including William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, actually do come to this area to attend these conferences. Um, so to think of Frederick Douglass, you know, attending a conference here in Massillon in the 1840s, um, that's just such a, a great connection and it shows that they were serious because if you get the, the major players of a movement to actually come to Massillon, that means that you've got a, a pretty great committee set up uh, to, to fight against uh, the institution of slavery. And so another major player who visits here in Massillon is Lucretia Mott, and she attends in 1847 uh, giving a lecture in downtown Massillon. So what's interesting about Mott is she's actually related to several of Massillon's earliest citizens. She is the niece of Mayhew and Mary Joy Folger, and her parents actually did live in Kendall for a very small period of time, but they ended up uh, in Pennsylvania afterwards. Uh, while she was here, she did sit for a portrait for Abel Fletcher, who had a studio uh, on South Erie Street. The building does still exist. So it's a very young portrait of Lucretia Mott. Typically when you see portraits of her, she is in much advanced age, um, but this, this is a, a kind of delicate portrait as she is you know, young and fighting for women's rights and uh, for the ending of slavery. Arvine Wales does actually mention uh, in his diary coming downtown to uh, to meet Lucretia Mott, and he thought that her, her lecture was very, uh, very pleasing, is what he says. So another of her relatives is Robert Folger. Um, he would later become mayor of Massillon. He was the justice of the peace. Uh, he was a lawyer here in town. And Robert Folger, he has a confirmed uh, home on the Underground Railroad. Uh, he's also kind of an amateur historian, and a lot of the stories of, of early Massillon come from Robert Folger. Uh, because he was here, he was living it, you know, his parents brought him here when he was small, but it was in 1813, so he saw, you know, a lot of history here in Massillon. So Robert took part, uh, you know, uh, providing a, a safe house for those who were uh, escaping slavery. We can probably assume that his parents also uh, were involved in that, but there is no real uh, evidence that that, um, that, that happened. Uh, but Robert took over his father's uh, hotel, the Commercial Inn, which was in downtown upon his death. And uh, one of the hotel managers that he employed was Jerry Clemens, who was a former slave uh, who found refuge here in Massillon. So some great connections and, you know, especially if you're escaping slavery, you know, you have to find a job and a house and, you know, how do you do those kinds of things? So for um, for various uh, you know, Quaker organizations to take people in uh, and for citizens to give them those opportunities, that's, that's a huge start. So there, uh, there's this list here uh, of the, the known conductors uh, along this Underground Railroad. Uh, again, not an actual railroad, but a network uh, of people. Uh, those who uh, provided safe haven were called conductors. Um, so these are supposedly the, the list of, of people who participated and provided safe haven. Now, this list was created in 1898, so, you know, a good 30 years after slavery ended. And, you know, by that time, people realized that it was kind of a noble cause to have been on the Underground Railroad. So we're not sure, you know, if some of these people are listed because they wanted to be recognized as such. But we do have, again, several major players uh, in Maslin history. Um, so we have uh, James Austin and uh, G. Hyle Fox, who are part of the Kendall community, so early settlers and uh, those who were uh, here in the 1820s. Charles Coffin, uh, a relative of Lucretia Mott. We have Charles Grant, uh, who was a black conductor who was uh, confirmed to be on uh, along the route, and he worked with uh, James Bayless to uh, actually provide a cart in the middle of the night to, to get people here to Massillon and to then take them further north if needed. William Moffat had a, a series of barns and farmlands uh, on the west side of Massillon, and uh, he was known 
to have had runaways hide in the cellars of his property. So just like the list of names of people who were, uh, you know, reportedly conductors on the Underground Railroad, um, there are also many houses that are supposedly on the Underground Railroad. Um, and to this day, you know, people will call the museum and say, aha, there was this certain rock at this certain angle on the thing, and there was this really cool cellar, and like this has to be part of the Underground Railroad. Uh, it's very, very tough to, um, to confirm those things. Uh, again, because it was so illegal to help slaves reach freedom, but then also to not then return them, uh, you know, by 1850, when you had to return them if you knew that they were escaped, um, you know, it, there's not a lot of documentation for this, for this at all. Um, so uh, typically you have to have some sort of, of source to confirm it. So these are five places in, in Maslin that were potential known stations. Several of them are on uh, historic 4th Street, so I think that's kind of an interesting Thing. I don't know if it's because maybe all the neighbors knew and they were supporting this activity. You know, maybe that was just where the, you know, uh, they were kind of off the beaten path, uh, you know, at the corner that these were. Um, the most confirmed one uh, is Spring Hill. And this one does have documentation that, that slaves were, in fact, uh, you know, fugitive slaves were hidden and uh, helped along the way to freedom. Several of the ways that, that fugitive slaves were able to cross into Ohio, uh, typically they would come from Virginia, which is now West Virginia, uh, often with the assistance of uh, you know, Quaker conductors. Uh, Thomas Roach was one of those who was known to go to the Ohio River and help people uh, across the border. Typically you'd come up to Massillon uh, and then you'd leave to Hartville or Limaville. And then they would go to Ravenna or Hudson and then typically to the northwest to Cleveland, and the, the end goal being to cross Lake Erie into Canada for that confirmed freedom. Since, again, not every escaped slave uh, was documented, we don't really know how many you know, escaped slavery, how many got to freedom, did they end up in Canada, you know, did they stay in this area, we don't know. Uh, some scholars say 40,000, some say 100,000, so the point is many tens of thousands of slaves wanted to get out of slavery. You know, as we look at this, this whole network, there's so much, in theory, illegal activity as people are helping these, these uh, fugitive slaves to freedom. And so none of the documentation is really there. So when you actually find something that confirms, uh, you know, an Underground Railroad stop or a fugitive slave, that's a huge moment. So what is so exciting is that here in Maslin, we have the Roach Wales papers that are at the Maslin Public Library. Uh, and they are all available for um, reading the original letter itself. There's searchable text, transcriptions, uh, and this is all available at maslinmemory.org. And you can get there uh, onto the site to read all of those letters. So the one confirmed letter that we do have is actually from George Duncan. And uh, he had stayed with uh, Thomas Roach on the farm and he called himself Jack while he was at the property so that he couldn't be tracked uh, by his real name. Uh, but he, he sends a, a letter to Thomas Roach thanking him for, uh, you know, for taking care of him and for sending him on his way. And uh, he asked that if, uh, his wife, Edie, uh, when she kind of comes through the area, if he could take care of her and uh, tell her to uh, make their way uh, to Geauga County to meet up. So Spring Hill's historic home did bring a lecturer who had done some research on George and Edie. And I was super excited to learn, thanks to his research, uh, that George and Edie did meet up and they did actually move to Canada and kind of live happily ever after. Um, you know, this is one of those stories that you, you hear over and over again, and so it was finally nice to hear the, the end of the story. Um, what I thought was interesting is that we always think of George and Edie as like maybe 20-somethings, maybe 30-somethings, and they're married and they're, they're going to go start this new life. They were definitely in their teens. This was like a, a Romeo and Juliet, you know, 15-year-olds who were, who were running away uh, to freedom. Um, but that lecture is available. Uh, on YouTube uh, should you want to learn, you know, the full story of George and Edie Duncan. Um, so it's, it's very much a rare thing, again, to have that documentation. Uh, there is also a 
uh, a letter from Charity Roach to her sister back on the East Coast that talks about how her nerves are so frayed from all of the, the fugitive slaves that are staying and, you know, to see all these, these sad women who have been clearly not in a great situation and, uh, you know, as they're making their way to freedom. So she's, you know, very anxious. And uh, so that's another uh, confirmation that, that Spring Hill provided uh, fugitive slaves with a, a safe haven. So uh, that letter is, is definitely part of um, a wonderful event, if you ever get the chance to go. The Underground Railroad Experience at uh, Spring Hill. It is a, a live play, and uh, they do reenact you know, as characters uh, within this documentation. And uh, you, you are taken throughout the property as if you are a fugitive slave who has just arrived uh, you know, seeking freedom. And it is a, a very, very emotional experience, and especially to be in a place where you know these things took place. It's a, it's a great, great event. There are several places within Spring Hill that, again, not really documented where everyone might have hidden, uh, but there is the, the Spring House seen here. These are the kind of ruins of. The whole building is, is gone except for this small cellar. Um, but this is the location where fugitive slaves were able to hide out until a trusted conductor could be found. And here is the photograph of what everyone refers to as the secret staircase. So this is kind of a, an interesting, super steep staircase that goes from the basement kitchen all the way to the servants' quarters on the second floor. So there's no doors or windows anywhere along that route. So the, the kind of legend goes, again, no real confirmation that this is not just a servant's staircase, uh, that uh, if you came into the basement kitchen, you could sneak up uh, to the second floor without being seen because there's no windows, there's no doors, and you could hide out in the, the small cupboard or attic crawl space, you know, move a sugar barrel in front of that door, and then lo and behold, you could hide out for a while. So again, this is kind of like one of those things that they still debate today, historians, you know, people who volunteer and work at Spring Hill, it's still definitely a discussion to whether or not all of these, these things actually happened. But there is, in the attic, Thomas and Charity Roach, again, being so dedicated to uh, ending slavery and assisting those affected by it. They didn't want to use the sugar cane from the Caribbean that they knew was being produced by slaves. Um, so they, they took it upon themselves to get some maple sugar and then honey from the hives of bees um, so that they wouldn't have to support the, the Caribbean sugar slave trade. So one of the other major incidents that is, is pretty well documented and shared over and over again is the slave catcher incident at Spring Hill. You know, during this time when, you know, suddenly slaves are, are able to be recaptured, there was a slave catcher known as DeCamp uh, who makes his way up to Spring Hill and uh, he is trying to track a fugitive slave woman and her children. And uh, Thomas Roach uh, apparently uh, confronts him and uh, reminds him uh, that uh, he has some farmhands uh, kind of nearby with some pitchforks and uh, that he should probably make his way off of the property. Uh, he's encouraged to leave, if you will. Um, DeCamp is the only slave catcher that's ever really mentioned by name. Um, and this is kind of still one of those legend moments. Um, but the, the tale is kind of told over and over again. Um, we've tried several times. Uh, various researchers and historians to kind of track down to camp, but we're really not quite sure, uh, you know, who exactly he was. But he seems like a, a pretty nefarious guy. The story goes that he would actually help slaves to escape uh, from, from their property uh, to kind of move north, and then he would recapture those slaves and bring them back to slavery to get the reward money. Um, so at any rate, he was a, he was a bad guy. So uh, one of those conductors seen here, this is James Bayless, and this is his home. This building does still exist, though it was kind of chopped apart into a smaller home and moved down the street to 4th Street. It used to be on Lincoln Way. Reportedly, again, James Bayless kind of in the 1890s started talking about his experiences in uh, assisting fugitive slaves. Uh, reportedly, uh, fugitive slaves would come up the canal uh, they would escape in a wagon that was arranged by James Bayless, and uh, that black conductor, Charles Grant, actually transferred the passengers to uh, either the home of Jacob Gaskins or uh, another uh, African-American nearby. Jacob Gaskins is kind of the only one who has uh, a lot of land at this time, so I'm going, to, I'm going to guess that it was probably all Jacob Gaskins. Uh, he was about four miles northeast of uh, Massillon, so, you know, the 
<laughs> as soon as you get out to the less populated areas, the, the less likely you are to be discovered you know, in a very populated downtown Massillon. Uh, so some of the fugitives did stop for, for work here in Massillon, and uh, one, uh, one was named uh, John Moore, and he found employment at James Bayless's sawmill. And uh, of course, Bayless was threatened with uh, prosecution for harbor harboring fugitives and especially hiring them. Um, so uh, Moore was sent to uh, work with uh, some other people, uh, including uh, G. Hyle Fox, Bayless's father-in-law. Uh, so Moore actually eventually opened a barber shop and uh, played at dances until the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 threatened his freedom and he reportedly fled to Canada. Again, not always sure all of the facts are true, uh, but those are the stories uh, that we have. Uh, so this is uh, Jacob Gaskins. He was originally from Winchester, Virginia, and uh, he was uh, given his freedom in 1817, and he settled in Stark County, Ohio. He was four miles northeast uh, of Massillon, as I just previously stated. He is uh, definitely a major player uh, in the Underground Railroad here in Stark County. And then uh, this is the family of Judge Anson Pease and his home, which was on Amherst Road. His family had a servant named Sidney Powell, who was a fugitive slave, and uh, she is credited with naming their house Roanoke because it resembled the house that she escaped from in Roanoke, Virginia. Sadly, Powell uh, was possibly kind of outed as a fugitive and uh, supposedly her master was on her trail. So the Peace family actually sent her to Canada to safety and freedom. Now, something interesting, um, Kent Jarvis had a lot of land and investments, business dealings here in Massillon. Um, many of his deeds and documents are here at the, the Massillon Museum in the archives. When I was going through his deeds, I noticed in the deeds from the 1830s that there were two sets of manumission papers. So freedom slave papers uh, for two, two slaves that, that were basically freed in the 1830s. One is Samuel Fuller and one is Matilda Ann Weaver. And uh, they were both from, you know, kind of the same region of Virginia. Still to this day, and we're still researching, do not know why they are here and why they were in Kent Jarvis's papers. What one of the wonderful researchers uh, Rosario has found out for me is that Fuller and Weaver both got married, but still can't quite track why they're, why they're up here in Massillon. So we're, we're hoping to find out someday why, you know, what their story is, what, what did the rest of their lives hold? Where did they establish themselves after they, you know, were freed uh, from, from slavery? So, um, so stay tuned. As soon as we, we get something, I'm hoping to, to post it and uh, share that with everybody. Another interesting thing, in, in addition to, um, you know, uh, various masters can free their slaves. Sometimes it happened when someone passed away. Um, you know, they could kind of grant freedom to uh, the slaves on their property. But you could also purchase a slave out of slavery into freedom. So this uh, document is a very interesting uh, look at basically crowdfunding to purchase uh, the wife of Isaac Cunningham. And what a thing to think of having to purchase someone's wife out of slavery into freedom. But the, the community got together. There were a few Massalonians who, uh, who signed this document, but this was kind of mostly uh, towards Salem, Ohio, that uh, they were working this out. But James Monroe Brown from Massillon did contribute $3 to this fund uh, to be able to uh, get Matilda freed from slavery. After this, I, I finally tracked down uh, in the Anti-Slavery Bugle, again, a great newspaper and resource for this, this era of time. Um, apparently, she, she was, in fact, freed from slavery. Uh, she did move to uh, Bloomfield, Ohio, and uh, she was actually one of the guest lecturers um, at uh, an anti-slavery meeting to tell everyone about her experiences. Um, so, so, thank goodness, happy ending. She was, in fact, uh, brought to freedom. So a lot of former slaves uh, did settle here in Massillon. Right here we have Gilbert Porter, uh, who was a slave in Tennessee, and uh, he successfully uh, escaped slavery in 1863 and met up with the Union Army. Uh, he actually served on the John Hall Memorial Industrial School, uh, which was specifically for African American children, and uh, he eventually operated a confectionery and uh, was a garbage collector, and uh, there's a great interview with him in the Massillon Independent in 1929. 
Um, so you can see his house still does exist on Walnut Road. Uh, Jerry Clemens' home also still exists on State Avenue, and one of these two photos is potentially him. Um, trying to track that down as he was a hotel manager uh, in downtown Maslin. He would have likely had uh, a really nice suit like this, um, so trying to confirm that. And here we have Wright Walker. Uh, Wright Walker was uh, born into slavery in Georgia, and during the Civil War he joined up with the Union Army and uh, General Sherman as he marched through the South. He became freed at the end of the war there, and he moved to New York for a small time, but he moved here with the Jarvis family uh, in Massillon. He was always generous in his contributions to local churches and charities, and uh, one of his most signature things uh, was wearing this top hat. He was working uh, up at the, the Burton Mansion on 4th Street, and uh, people recall seeing him mow the grass, and he still had this top hat on. Uh, upon his death, he left several uh, bequests to local churches, including St. Timothy's Church, to the Salvation Army, and he made a $30,000 contribution to the Tuskegee Institute, uh, which is a college for African-American students that was founded by Booker T. Washington. And that was the largest uh, contribution from an African-American up till that time, an amazing legacy that he left. So slavery, having been here in America from 1619, uh, finally ended in 1863 on January 1st, uh, as Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation took effect. Uh, so this uh, basically freed three million slaves in Confederate states, and uh, you know that was a, a very large, uh, you know, freedom moment. Uh, but sadly, not all Confederate states informed their slaves that they were free. Um, so uh, as uh, the Civil War came to an end and uh, the Union Army started to move into various parts of the Confederacy, uh, there were places in Texas that no one had informed anyone that they were free. Um, so uh, as the, uh, they made an announcement on June 19, 1865, that, uh, hey, by the way, all slaves here are, are now free. Um, and so it is June 19th, which is uh, June plus 19th, Juneteenth. Uh, that is the official annually celebrated Freedom Day, uh, which was really, you know, even though the, the Emancipation Proclamation took place in 1863, you know, the real Freedom Date uh, is Juneteenth in 1865. So I hope you learned a few facts about the Underground Railroad um, and uh, I hope someday to be able to answer some of the questions that we have and to find further documentation. So thank you for joining me. Sharing a big family moment working hard from home, relaxing with a friend. Welcome to life, engaged, where reliable internet has never been more important. MCTV extends your family's reach with consistent speeds and whole home Wi-Fi, making life at home engaged, no matter what's thrown your way. MCTV, we go the extra smile.